And recently we did have an example of a client who was a bit hesitant at first because it was a lot of leaders. It was a hard scheduling challenge. We almost gave up on, you know, not including some people, but in the end we got everyone together. And afterwards he did actually pull me and this was Mike uh, to the side and he said, this was one of the most valuable exercises our leadership team has done this year yet. Yeah, that's and, awesome. and that was really neat for us because it we had pushed really hard for it and it was really cool that he saw the value. And we'll, we'll go into some of those exercises here in a second, but I think, I don't know how all other tech consultants work, but I imagine this is maybe a unique part of us, or how we're unique in the space is like, we're not just walking in and working with IT and like trying to implement some technology. We're like, hey, get us a meeting with your C-suite so we can make sure we're all yeah. strategically aligned. So I was going to say the hardest part of a leadership interview has nothing to do with the actual interview yeah. or the most challenging part. It's the scheduling. Yeah. And so we actually typically schedule this meeting uh, before we even have the kickoff, before the project gets going at all. However, I will say whether it's our great sales conversations or just setting up the project at the very beginning, every project we've done has created a space to get their C-suite yeah. or you know whoever is in charge of the people that the project's going to impact because they really see the value. And I think that speaks a lot of the time to the types of companies we're working with. They're coming to us for help and they really want to implement a solution there. So they're willing to spend the time. Yeah, um, I remember years ago when this concept came up where we're like, oh my gosh, we're going to meet with all the leaders of a business. And how are we going to do that? You just ask, you just say, yes. this is part of our process. And all of a sudden it happens. It might take, yeah, take a little bit of scheduling and, and iteration, but that's the way to do it. You just, mm -hmm. that we, we make that part of, of our process. And I mm -hmm. think it's been really helpful to, um, yeah, even just get to know people so that we understand all the players um, as we make progress through through the project. And recently we did have an example of a client who was a bit hesitant at first because it was a lot of leaders. It was a hard scheduling challenge. We almost gave up on, you know, not including some people. But in the end, we got everyone together. And afterwards, he did actually pull me and this was Mike uh, to the side. And he said, this was one of the most valuable exercises our leadership team has done this year yet. Yeah, that's and, awesome. and that was really neat for us because it we had pushed really hard for it and it was really cool that he saw the value in that. We're, we're calling this segment like understanding of the client. So we're sort of getting aligned. We understand what we're trying to do, but now we sort of need to like get in their corner and understand exactly where they're at so that we can uh, move whatever needle that they're trying to move. So we have two different exercises that we commonly do. One is audiencing and one is uncovering the why. I'm going to go ahead and run with one of them, even though I'm like sort of interviewing you guys. I I uh, have been doing this audiencing exercise for a little bit. And the core of it is understanding how the project team thinks about their company and groups them according to different kind of segments within their company. Different audiences. Different audiences. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and what we do within there is understand, okay, in regards to what we're trying to impact with this project, what does the that group think right now? Like what is their perception of this thing? How what do they have any feelings associated with that? Are they like just tired of of not just being drowned in email and they they can't get out of it. And so um, do they actually take any action because of that? Because they're they're so uh, yeah tired and exhausted. Now they just ignore emails, or they just don't. They they just let the inbox fill up, and who knows? Some sometimes that things just never get read. So we go through that. Like, what do they think? How do they feel? And what are things that they do because of how they think and feel? And so we go through all of the different audiences in an organization and document that live in the meeting. And then we hit pause and say, okay, this gives us an understanding. Let's talk about what we want them to think and feel and do. So what's the transformation that we want to cause and, and make happen during or at the end of this project? Um, so then we go through, hey, we, we don't want them to be exhausted by their inbox. We want them to be comfortable and not be overwhelmed. We want communication to feel easy and seamless. And so we want them to then... Yeah, be be open with each other and 
communicate with each other and not look at it as, oh my gosh, I'm just filling up someone else's inbox and um, they feel like they can stay on top of things. Mm -hmm. So we go through each of the audiences and, and document that again live mm -hmm. so that we can then look back at the end of the project and say, did we move this needle? Is, is this something we've made progress on? So what are what would we say are some of the things that we uncover within this exercise? A few that come to my mind are um, we often understand the outcomes that they're looking to get out of certain groups of people. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't mean get out of those people in the uh, transactional sense. More, we want to enable this group to be able to get data reporting easier so that yep. they can make data-driven decisions. And so we often get to these bigger outcomes while going through what do they think? What do they feel? Which can feel really flowery, but it really drives home the bigger question of, well, why? Oh, so that they can make decisions based on data or that they can get more work done because they have too many emails in their inbox. Or So it's these different things that more flowery questions will lead to actually bigger outcomes. Yeah, they get some thinking for sure. It also enables us to identify what is the primary audience for the change or the work that we're doing? So perhaps an organization has, you know, people that are back in an office, people that are out on the field, or people who are doing project management versus, you know, maybe accounting or more uh, uh, some other tasks. It really helps to uh, isolate and say, well, these are the people that are really impacted the mm -hmm. most by this change, so that we can ar isolate and work uh, primarily with them or maybe talk to them and, and deal with their problems first and then deal with others later if they're the ones that are gonna be the most impacted mm -hmm. or that have the, have the biggest problems, have the biggest challenges related to this work. And often through this exercise, we do find other pain points that this particular project may not address and that can be set to the side and added to a recommended next step uh, within the company. And again, that's really all about shedding light on different issues so that those leaders can make the decisions around how they're going to solve those problems. But for sure, narrowing the focus to understand which end users are we going to impact the most, yep. which leads us usually into the next exercise, which is uncovering the why. But yep. you kind of have to do audiencing first to really understand the groups that you're going to focus on. Or the project just needs to be super focused, right? Yes. So in a case where somebody's asking us to do something very, very focused within their organization, audience, the actual audiencing may be very short or maybe very focused. Mm -hmm. um, and then it leads right into, oh, like, why? Like, yeah. why is this a problem? Why is this a challenge? Which is the next piece, um, which is literally continuing to ask why until there is no more whys, right? Like, <laughs> it can uh, feel annoying, we'll yeah, say, why? Uh, why? You know, it's, it's, why? it's the con concept of taking one of these problems, one of these challenges that have been identified and saying, why is that a problem, right? Like, what does that, what does that mean for you? Um, and then most of the time when somebody answers, it won't really be the real why. It'll be something that is tangent, adjacent to the real reason. And that, that helps us connect the dots in a big way. I do want to asterisk this. Uh, I got these a couple of these exercises from our friends over at People Design. We went to a workshop a while ago. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have kind of adapted some of this for, for what we do. But um, throwing them a, 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 a little credit Shout here. Out. Yeah. Um, but it, it reminds me of like the, maybe something that people would understand is if someone comes in and says, I need my website to be mobile friendly. Okay. What, what, why does that matter? Like, sure. I'm a web developer. I can do that. But why does that matter? Well, we want to make sure that people can read things on their phone. Okay. Why does that matter? Because uh, we, actually get a lot of traffic on our website on phones and we want to make sure that we're appearing as hip and cool and and up to date okay if that's what you want to spend money on okay but i feel like there's something else there um well we we want to appear that way because we're actually losing some of our um, customers to some of our competitors that are more mobile friendly and seem to be more friendly to the the, the younger crowd Oh, that's interesting. Is that a lot of is that a lot of customers? Oh, yeah. Like honestly, we sell fifty percent of our goods through our website, and so you start to like extrapolate all this information that says, oh, this isn't a mobile friendly 
website project. This is a we're fixing a sales bottom line yeah. project. Um, so then we, we know that as we're working on, this isn't our actual project, but as the web developers working on a mobile website, they are continuously integrating the, how does this affect sales into it as opposed mm -hmm. to just making it look better. Yep. And this can be so key, especially I think you kind of mentioned the knowledge base or the internet, understanding the pain points with different employees. One, one internet we launched was at a fully remote company. So it was really important to understand the why behind where things needed to be placed, the navigation. And we, we do incorporate this into really any type of project and really any meeting we're having. We like to ask a lot of questions, classic consultants. But this particular exercise at the beginning of a project will help us get to that faster. Um, and then likely really integrate it into all of our design conversations further on. Yep. Yeah. It's, it's a fun one because, yeah, you, you sort of have to get creative around not upsetting someone by keeping asking mm -hmm. why or, like, finding a different way to ask the question. But as long as, um, you know, the, the folks in the meeting are entertaining of the conversation, it can be uh, quite fun to kind of dig and, and mm -hmm. prod and make sure that we're getting at the heart of things. Yeah. Should we continue on to um, our next phase, which is uh, mapping and digging deeper? So we're, we, we kind of have set the stage. We understand the client situation a bit. Now we sort of uh, want to do a couple things. We want to understand the technology and kind of map that out or maybe understand more about a business process and, and dig into that. How do we approach those things? So uh, yeah. the technology mapping one. Well, we like to start with technology mapping because I think it creates a amazing visual uh, as far as what technology is your company using. And a lot of it comes out, people forget, oh, yeah, that team does use that or we do use that. Or, and at the end of it, you have this huge map. We usually do, um, we use a tool called Whimsical. We love Whimsical. And you could use Microsoft Whiteboard, though, as well. And you map everything out um, in terms of what devices. So especially thinking about industries where you have people in the field. They might be on tablets. They might be on phones. Is it bring your own device? Are there any conditional access policies? We start thinking through devices. But then we go into software and understanding what license people have, um, which is super important for us. If we're going to make recommendations, we want to make sure we're in line and we're explaining any costs associated with anything. Um, but by the end of it, you have this really a picture, a technology picture of everything that the company is using. And most of the time, at least the projects I've worked on, the client has never actually taken the time to sit down and map that out and really take it in themselves to understand how much technology their different teams are using and if there's any duplication or if there's any just things clearly are not linking together and it seems like there's a lot of silos forming. So something magical happens when you get it all down on a page. And for us, it's just really informative so that we understand where the gaps are and that we can bring that into our design. Yeah, outside of IT folks, the, like other people might not even be able to comprehend all the different tools. That Super recently, um, we're running a, a workshop for a, a client and we were in one of these conversations and it got brought up that one of their teams just collaboration on Teams, Microsoft Teams is not working for them, so they just use Google Docs, mm -hmm. which is not within their tenant, it's not within their domain, it's not, and Somehow they were they honest, <laughs> they were honest, and you know, the leadership understood that the tool that they were provided was not working for them, but that's a security issue, so that's definitely going to have to be something that can be moved through. Mm -hmm. Love it. So we've, we've kind of created this, this map so that everyone can see exactly what is being used for what, and uh, what all those line items on the bill uh, are. So um, let's go into our business process deep dive. So the context around this is someone is trying to automate something or streamline something, and they're maybe asking a question around, how do I do this better, or can I use some, some technology to make this work better? The couple times that I've done this is it's very similar. Like we start with a blank page and we say, a blank whimsical most of the time and say, where do we start and where do we end? And what are all the pieces that connect in between? And so uh, w the things that we try to do is kind of separate the ideal world and the current state because we want to, we need to understand the current state in order to influence the future state. And so we say, 
right now, how does all this work? And so they walk mm -hmm. through something of, oh, this comes in from an email inbox, people read it, and then they go create a ticket from it, or they, they take action on it, and they route it to this person. And we just, it starts to create this labyrinth of, of logic, and then hopefully it all comes out to, on one side uh, together, maybe with a little bit of pain. But that lets us see, okay, here's the process that um, we're tasked with mm -hmm. influencing and, and helping make better. So then we can basically take it and divide it up when, like I feel like we commonly do this is we'll create like phases like maybe the client hasn't even thought of this thing in phases before but really there's like an intake there's a processing there's a service and then there's like a follow-up or something mm -hmm. um, and so we'll lay all those out and look at them kind of in their own window and say what would the ideal scenario be and how can some of the tech that they do have today uh, play a role in that or does it not work and they need mm -hmm. to start looking into other tech in order to do that? So yeah. that's like a flyby of, yeah. of what I that is. I think you summed that up really well. The color I want to give to it is oftentimes the people taking us through exactly what you're talking about of, okay, what happens next? Are a lot of times the people that were not on the original calls or really part of the leadership, they're more doers. Yep. But then it's very eye-opening and can almost be a therapy session, uh, one client had joked, yeah. that sharing actually how frustrating or manual the process is and then having the leader actually there listening, uh, oh gosh, I didn't realize you also had to do that. Oh, mm -hmm. and then you have to do that and that sounds frustrating. Yeah. Um, it can be very therapeutic and okay, what is the ideal stage that we're trying to get to? And I, re I just remember one client being like, man, this is gonna change my life at work. Oh, you know, yeah. to be able to take it from how we had it mapped out to then that ideal state and have that leader involved in that conversation to, to hear how manual some of these processes can be. It reminds me of that undercover boss show. Where, A little bit, Where yeah. it's like, yeah, you, you really get to see how the hamburgers are made mm -hmm. uh, right right, right in front of you. So, yeah, yeah it's, it's, that exercise is a lot of fun.